I'll get started. I'm Nassim. I'm one of the founders of Seed the Commons. For those of you who are not familiar with us yet, Seed the Commons is a small organization based in San Francisco. Um, and we work towards the you know, radical transformation of our food systems. And we do that in large part through public education, um, usually geared towards just helping people either become active on certain issues or give them tools to be better activists. Um, and on World Food Day this year, October 16th, we, want, we launched a webinar series, Rethinking Food and Agriculture in a Time of COVID and Climate Change. And so it's really about, um, you know, showing how the transformation of our food systems is really vital to addressing almost all of the issues that we're facing today, whether we're talking about public health issues or um, environmental issues or social justice issues. A lot of it really comes down to what kind of food systems do we have? What kind of, you know, how are we treating the land, et cetera. Um, so I want to just say like a couple words about this particular webinar today. Um, you know, the topic is sort of agricultural solutions um, to healing the planet. And that's kind of the topic of, of several of our webinars, not this one um, solely, but we're really starting today to look at um, on the ground solutions. And uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about the beef industry. Now, normally, see, the Commons does not really focus on specific industries so much as speak more about systemic problems and systemic change. And we don't actually focus um, usually all that much on the specifics of animal agriculture. But I think that when we're talking about solutions to climate change and other environmental issues, it is worthwhile to really stop and talk about um, grazing and beef and these things because it features so prominently in a lot of the discourse these days around both climate change and also solutions to climate change. And so last week we had a webinar with George Werthner, um, who's an ecologist who's worked for decades in the American West and who's written a lot about grazing in the West. So if you didn't watch that, I invite you to, to watch it. Um, we'll put it on YouTube next week, but it's already on our Facebook page. You can watch that afterwards. And so this is a bit of a part two of that. Um, so our first speaker is going to speak about um, the present day realities of beef production and whether this is um, or can be truly part of the solution to climate change. Um, and then our second speaker is a um, biointensive grower. Now we're going to have quite a few ecological veganic farmers join the webinar series over the next few weeks. Um, I really wanted this particular person to join us today because um, the biointensive approach is uh, something that was developed kind of locally and their main training and research center is just a few hours north of San Francisco and Mendocino. And so we're in a place, and we talked about this last week, where there's a huge, um, you know, ranching culture, a lot of land is devoted to ranching. And uh, north of us, there's the situation in Point Reyes National Park. For those of you who aren't here, I know there are people from the UK, you might not have heard of this, but there's a conflict in a national park between dairy farmers on the one hand and the native wildlife and specifically native tule elk has, you know, gotten a lot of press. Um, and so we talked a bit about this conflict and the defense that comes around this is that the dairy farming that's local to here is actually really um, beneficial to our local ecosystems and to our, it's part of our strategy to addressing climate change. So I thought it would be great to have somebody else who's local to here to join us and give an example of an approach towards sustainability that's done on these same lands and that doesn't involve the cow. Um, and another reason that I think that um, it's good to start with biointensive is that their, their, their um, focus at the beginning was really on minimizing land use and conserving resources. And I think that that can kind of lead us in these future weeks towards um, thinking about kind of degrowth and rewilding, which also relates to what we spoke about in the past two weeks. All right, so before we get started, I'm going to actually let Chema, who's um, the other founder of Seed the Commons, give a little bit of a historical background to what we're talking about today. 
Thank you, Nassim. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chema Hernandez-Gill. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Seed the Commons. It's, um, I, I'm very happy to be here uh, to talk to you a little bit about what I have seen in terms of uh, uh, cattle and what I have learned, actually. Um, and perhaps uh, to do that, I, I first need to give a little bit of background uh, so that uh, you can better understand the perspective and the context. Um, my family comes from a small town in Mexico. Um, and uh, very early on, I became aware of certain conflicts that existed between the ranchers and uh, the people in my town. And um, I, I was a little bit uh, surprised by it as I grew older. It seemed uh, kind of a little bit strange. Um, and then I started realizing that there were a lot of parallels pretty much everywhere, right, around these, uh, the, these conflicts, these tensions that exist between uh, indigenous uh, uh, towns, indigenous peoples, and ranchers. In the history of my town, it was uh, very straightforward. Uh, we basically had indigenous peoples uh, who were uh, settled and uh, land was granted to ranchers, um, oftentimes uh, coming directly from Spain. And, um, and when I say granted, it was literally uh, gifted to, to these uh, Spanish uh, uh, arrivals, right? And, and I'm also talking about huge, vast amounts of land, often the most fertile land uh, near these indigenous villages. And this is a story that uh, we kept seeing basically, uh, if not from 1492, uh, definitely uh, from the early 1500s in, in many parts of what is now Mexico, uh, in many parts of what is now the United States. This situation um, was uh, really in a, 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 I don't know what the right word would be. I, I, I keep using the word in, in my mind of terraforming, right? And it is kind of that we have a, an entire continent with no uh, domesticated, no large domesticated animal, certainly nothing that even resembles the cow, right? In 1491 and uh, within a, a few, uh, hundred years, we end up with with millions upon millions of these animals. And of course, it's it requires um, there to be a massive reorganization of the land. Right. Uh, and we end up with a situation very quickly of this pursuit of land for ranching, uh, for the sake of ranching. Um, the way I, I was explaining it, it uh, is that you have a lot of these colonizers who come to the continent uh, looking for gold uh, and, and realize that maybe there isn't so much gold, but that there is a lot of land and that that land is a great thing that they can use for uh, the cattle, right? Uh, so, so that's what drives a lot of the uh, colonization of certainly the West and the United States, but uh, in many other parts of the country as well. Um, and we end up with the current situation that we now have in the United States that again is mirrored in many parts of Canada and many parts of Mexico, many parts of South America, right? Uh, in the United States, we have about 94 million cattle. Uh, some states like Nebraska have many times more cattle than people. Um, a, a, uh, the amount of land that is right now being dedicated to uh, livestock grazing, you know, cow country, is comparable to the state of Texas, right? Um, and I, I'm sure, or I hope that many of you have seen the figures that uh, about 41% of US land is being used to feed farm animals. And I'm sure uh, we'll hear about these sorts of uh, figures before, right? But, uh, uh, sorry, uh, a little bit later, right? But one example that really sticks to me, a recent example, is the uh, Bear Ears National Monument in Utah. Now, um, this monument, it's a national uh, treasure, frankly. Um, it's sacred and very significant to many indigenous nations in the area of, uh, in this part of what is now Utah. Uh, but it is an area that is uh, protection, whose protection is strongly opposed to, uh, opposed by the ranchers. Um, and it saw its size reduced by 85% by the Trump administration in 2017, right? So again, I, I reiterate, um, it, it's been a very shocking um, 
change in the way we use land in this continent. It has gone from uh, not a single cattle, not a single foot of land being used for grazing to, to uh, a, a terraforming, right, uh, of a continent, uh, largely for the benefit of these ranchers, right? It's something we continue to see that we saw, have seen for the hundred past few hundred years. And what's uh, most frustrating to me now is that uh, they are now trying to pivot and portray themselves as saviors and a solution to, to many of the problems that they and, and definitely their predecessors and ancestors were responsible for. They, they end up uh, extracting the land's fertility to turn it into flesh. Um, so it's, uh, it's important, I think, to give some, some of that background. It's something that, again, is mirrored here in North America. We see it in many parts of South America. We see it definitely in Australia and in New Zealand. And um, in many ways, to me, it is the central, uh, it, it became very quickly the central purpose of colonization and settler colonialism in, in these lands uh, to the detriment of of course, the animals, um, but also the people, right? So, um, yeah, I, I'm sure we'll hear about it more. And if there are any questions, uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss this a little bit later. All right. So the first um, speaker now is uh, Jennifer Molidor. Um, she's the senior food campaigner at the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, she helps lead the Center for Biological Diversity Sustainable Food Initiatives, including the Take Extinction Off Your Plate campaign um, for the Center's Population and Sustainability Program. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and I appreciate that bit of a background and I think Chema is going to um, share a presentation that I'll walk through. That's who we are, the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, as Nassim said, um, you know, my population and sustainability program that I work with addresses the human impact of wildlife and wild places caused by population uh, pressure, unsustainable consumption, and destructive production practices. We focus on uh, food systems through the work I do, particularly industrial livestock production as the industry with the greatest impact um, that people have on the planet and biodiversity. If you can scroll through ne the next maybe two slides. So the biggest crises facing the planet are climate change and biodiversity loss. And the biodiversity loss is, is often kind of kept out of the conversation with the climate change, but the related um, crises that we need to fix and the 95 million cattle in the US are a leading contributor to that, both beef and dairy cattle. Um, you can see there that some of the impacts that cattle have are species endangerment. And I've listed that first because it's often left out of the conversation, climate change, habitat loss, water withdrawals for irrigation for feed crops and pollution, and so much more. Next slide, please. Thank you. So a lot of this conversation going on right now about cattle and regenerative beef and grazing and the impacts on climate change uh, focus on production methods. And we're going to get into that for sure in terms of solutions. But just looking at the problems, it's really important that we think about consumption, about how much Americans in particular, and, and I apologize, this is American focus, but um, how much we are consuming annually in terms of milk and cheese, in terms of uh, beef and burgers and that kind of thing, and the impact that it has. And so we're measuring this in terms of the greenhouse gases, the land use that is taken up by cattle grazing, um, but also the manure impacts and the pollution and the, and the water withdrawals. Um, it takes an incredible amount of water to raise just a pound of beef, something like 1,800 gallons. Next slide, please. So we've created these Extinction Fact cards that you can find at extinctionfacts.org or takeextinctionoffyourplate.com. And the point is kind of to mirror the Nutrition Facts cards um, to kind of outline that individual diets as well as the sort of annual collective um, diets are having this impact on the planet. So if you're wondering if your diet has an impact right away for beef and for dairy, you know, we're making that connection, not only, as I just said, through manure and water and land use and habitat and greenhouse gases, 
but to wildlife. So a lot of people have, you know, an easy connection to say, well, this burger is harming a cow or so forth. Um, they're connecting to the pigs and the cows and the chickens, but not necessarily to the wolves and the bears and the bison and the sage grouse and the mussels and the fox and so on. So part of what I'm trying to do with my outreach and campaign work on this is to make the connection for people that our food production and particularly beef is having substantial impact on our climate, on our environment, but also on biodiversity and wildlife. Um, it's also to, important, I think, to note that Americans eat two to three times the global average of beef. So just to put that in perspective, um, this is an industry where not only are we consuming too much, but the uh, government is helping this industry pollute the planet um, by producing too much. And each year, dairy producers are bailed out. For example, in 2016, the USDA spent $20 million, taxpayer dollars, um, to buy a million pounds of, 11 million pounds of cheese that nobody wanted. And recently with the coronavirus, the food assistance program um, bailouts, the first round is $10 billion and the beef and dairy industry and the producers who grow the crops that feed these cattle got 70% of that bailout. So that's an enormous amount of money, it's an enormous amount of um, support. This is all in addition to the subsidies that we pay for this polluting industry. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanna run through this and I wanna talk about the solutions in a minute, but I still wanna kind of just lay out the problems just so that we're all clear on what we're talking about. Now, obviously factory farms are bad. Factory farms gotta go. Right, uh, that's part of our policy is we recommend a moratorium on factory farms, um, but really it's a system that is archaic and it needs to go and has an enormous amount of environmental impacts from contamination of the air, water, um, contamination of groundwater, harm to endangered species, greenhouse gases. Um, factory farms are unimaginably cruel to 9 billion animals that are raised for slaughter annually just in the US. And as you can see from this picture here, I think those are dairy cows, the filthy conditions that these facilities have lead them to use antibiotics prophylactically before animals are even sick to prevent disease instead of having you know, sanitary conditions in these places. Um, next slide, please. Some of the other problems with factory farms though, the CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations are uh, more directly the increase the tripling of these things, just getting these enormous agri agricultural facilities that are just basically animal factories, um, producing this new, enormous amount of manure. And manure is not something that is, is talked about as broadly as climate change is, but it has emissions from the manure as well. But also factory farms produce 13 times as much waste as the entire US population in 2012. That's a lot. And it's not just a lot, but it's often untreated spread on the fields, gets into the ground tables and the water is poorly managed. The emissions come from it is a problem, but it's also toxic and gets into our waterways. Um, the EPA uh, estimates that it pollutes 40% of the rivers and streams in the United States. And it's probably more than that. Next slide, please. Okay, so another area that is often overlooked um, when we talk about factory farm is the the aspect that supports that, which is the slaughterhouse. Um, we're one of the few groups that is working from an environmental point of view on slaughterhouses, because it doesn't immediately come to mind, but slaughterhouses pollute our rivers too. As you can see uh, on the top picture there, meat and poultry processing facilities are a leading source of water pollution. In 2018, slaughterhouses released 55 million pounds of toxic substances directly into the nation's rivers and streams, and that's just the ones that are released directly and not necessarily spread over the fields, for example. So you just want to you know, be very clear in terms of the pollution that the slaughterhouses are a problem too. And I want to come back to that because not only is it threatening our waters and our wildlife and our human health, um, but the rules on this are lax. And then the previous administration and even beyond that, but the previous administration um, has, has weakened these environmental regulations, has weakened water laws, has weakened um, you know, USDA inspection for slaughterhouses. And this is endangering workers and this is a justice issue and it's endangering the animals as well. It's a humane issue, but it's also a pollution issue. Uh, and, and we'll come back to, to why I'm mentioning that as well. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so another issue that is often left out and won't go into it too much right now, but is irrigation. So the way that the beef and dairy industry impact our environment through feed crops, all the corn, soy, et cetera, um, in, the, in the heartland, the monocrops, um, not only are they tilling the fields, not only is this terrible for the soil, but they're drenching the crops in pesticides, they're killing pollinators and jeopardizing biodiversity. But often feed crops are left out of the equation and the numbers when the agricultural industry talks about methane and carbon emissions of animal agriculture. And they'll say, oh, it's very low in the United States. And it's because they're not counting the land use that goes into producing the feed crops that feed the animals. Um, and this is true for water footprint as well, right? It takes an enormous amount of water to produce these feed crops. If you're interested in learning more about this, Brian Richter has a recent study, I think it was in Nature, where he talked about the ways that the uh, demand for burgers um, in Seattle and Austin and um, Los Angeles and, and kind of just all over these urban areas are actually draining the Colorado River dry, impacting aquatic life, obviously, and the streams and riverbed health and fish species. And, you know, people are disconnected to burgers in these cities and they're not thinking, well, I'm really just draining the West dry. Um, but that's what's happening right now. And so there's a few steps of logic, but it, it is for the irrigation of feed crops for cattle in the arid west where cattle are non-native species and don't quite belong. Next slide, please. So obviously I think everybody's probably familiar with the fact that animal agriculture contributes 16.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Some people um, suggest that it's a higher amount, but we'll go with that just to be conservative. And just to be clear, when we're talking about solutions in a minute about carbon sinks and, and this kind of thing, um, that methane is also a problem and it's often downplayed by the agricultural industry, but methane and nitrous oxide have as much as 36 and 298 times greater global warming potential, respectively, um, than the, you know, as a carbon equivalent over a hundred year period. So methane is very, very powerful and it needs to be part of the conversation. But even beyond this, when we're talking about what's happening in the world, we're still leaving out the impact on biodiversity, even from the greenhouse gas emissions. So let's talk about grazing impacts. Next slide, please. So here's a picture comparing heavy grazing, light grazing, and I have a, a picture coming up of, that I've taken myself. Um, but what's really important to understand about grazing as an alternative to factory farms or as part and parcel of factory farms, um, is the impact that it has on the land, even when it's done as, as responsibly as possible and ideally as possible, it's still cows on lands where they don't belong in the arid west, for example, and cows are having impacts that non-native or that native ungulates are not having. So cattle destroy native vegetation, they damage the soil, they contaminate waterways with fecal waste, they deplete rivers, as I mentioned, to irrigate feed crops. Um, grazing turns streams and riparian areas into wastelands. Overgrazing makes regions prone to uh, unnaturally severe fires, as we're seeing in the West out here. And um, it's controversial because cows are often used to mow down the fuel for fires, but then they leave um, invasive weeds behind that are highly flammable. So the livestock industry, particularly cattle, also remains the leading opponent to wolf recovery programs and grazing directly impacts biodiversity and wildlife um, and habitat and includes predator and other wildlife killing programs. And I just wanna mention those briefly and just in case you're not aware of them. Next slide. So um, let's talk about recovery programs, federal state agencies just briefly and how this livestock wildlife conflict is imagined in our mythology as something that's a conflict with wildlife rather than a conflict with non-native cattle being invasive on these lands. Next slide, please. So I hope that you've heard of wildlife services. If not, um, I recommend you looking into them. So my organization has been involved with this at the county and state and federal level. Um, the lawsuits that have been successful and I've testified myself. This is something really important that you can get involved in yourself right away today. Um, wildlife Services is a federal program. It's, it's something that I think counties and also maybe states can opt in using taxpayer dollars that shoots, traps, poisons um, millions of animals, uh, wolves, foxes, bears, 
uh, mountain lions for livestock with little to no oversight, um, no accountability, no requirement to disclose its activities to the public, often violating um, environmental regulations like NEPA, not doing the proper reviews and this kind of thing. But many of the methods that wildlife services use, it's just really this rogue program, um, are cruel and just incredibly cruel and, and toxic for the environment and using um, devices like cyanide bombs that have been banned in some states. Um, in these traps, you know, we've trapped uh, children and pets bald eagles um, and so it's just this really rogue rampant destructive program with no oversight and um, it's got to go this is not this is not a coexistent non-lethal program so it's a problematic one as well and one of the things that you can do or that people can do is to find out if your co county contracts with them and demand that they stop and that they um, you know don't cater to the public lives the private livestock industry in order to have wildlife management um, and then on the right there is the Mexican gray wolf recovery program in the southwest. Mexican gray wolf is one of the most endangered wolf species and the recovery is extremely fragile and it's hindered and harmed by the livestock industry. Surprise, surprise. Um, the lobbying of the beef ranchers has resulted in unparalleled obstacles for the recovery. They have been blocking um, release of whole families in a way that has led to just kind of this this population dwindling and the recover recovery program failing and, um, and sort of inbred situation where we're losing the ability to have any biodiversity even in this program. Next slide, please. So as Nassim mentioned, the Point Reyes National Seashore in Northern California in the Bay Area is an example with the Tula Elk of the clash between livestock producers and native wildlife and public lands, for example. So if you're not familiar with these issues with Yellowstone and with Point Reyes, I recommend that you kind of look into this. There's two documentaries, uh, there's more than that, but there's, there's documentaries for each of these um, issues and there's uh, quite a, a bit of activism that you can join as well. But so in Point Reyes, um, same thing with the National Park Service is kind of hazing, shooting, um, the native Tula elk on behalf of the livestock ranchers in that area who have expired leases in that area. Um, and uh, this is happening on public land. This is happening in the area where, you know, people are, are the dairy farmers, but they also have the grass fed beef. And it's this kind of trend about, you know, all of this agriculture is really good for this area. And it's, um, it's nonsense, you can go visit for yourself. You can see that the tula elk are being kept from their native water sources. They're being fenced out, for example, and they're dying of thirst. Um, Yellowstone bison, on the other hand, are being called annually by the National Park Service as well for, um, on behalf of cattle ranchers who are outside the park. So when the bison migrate outside the park, you know, cattle ranchers are saying, oh, they're gonna give us this disease from transferring from um, bison to cows that has never been proven to happen. So here we're having public servants, so to speak, killing this native wildlife on public lands on behalf of the beef industry. This is not how I think that your average American is imagining that their, you know, classic animals in public lands and these wonderful places um, are kind of managing. Next slide, please. So those are similar problems. And there's many more. But some of the solutions presented um, trending right now and available right now are no meat. That's one way to go. It's obviously going to reduce your impact on the planet in terms of cattle contributing to climate change and biodiversity loss. But not everybody's going to do that. So we personally uh, advocate for less meat, substantial reduction of beef in particular. Um, but there's other groups going, you know, kind of advocating for better meat. So thinking about production processes and how can we do this more sustainably and um, sink carbon and live, you know, coexist and use non-lethal predator management and this kind of thing. They're focusing on the better aspect rather than usually at the detriment to the less, right? So that less message is getting lost. And then there's a problem right now as well where people hear some of these messages and think, well, I was going to eat chicken. And um, we're seeing a shift in consumer trends from beef to chicken. And that's a problem too. That's a whole nother, pro you know, presentation with the nitrous, uh, the pollution elements that come in with chicken. So we need to take one of these options, but we need, we advocate for less and for switching from uh, your meat 
to plant-based options as well. Next slide, please. So um, another solution presented is for the US Roundtable on Sustainable Beef, but it's been organized um, and participated by fast food companies. So we have um, Walmart, you have um, McDonald's, you have Burger King, for example, and it's great that they're coming to the table on this, but there's my criticism of this um, is that there's no clear standards. There's no clear definition of what sustainable beef is. It's not compulsory. So, you know, ranchers can opt in and say that they're sustainable and they're working towards sustainability. They don't actually have to do anything. Nobody's checking or holding them accountable. There's no incentives, which any kind of program like this needs to have um, in order to meet benchmarks. And there's no real transparency for the public. And it doesn't address the fact that the industry as a whole, they really wanna be sustainable and have better production methods, um, need to have less beef, right? They need to shrink the size of the production. So there's my criticism of that. Next slide, please. Um, and other trends that you might see from similar uh, companies are to change the feed that we feed cattle. So we add lemongrass to their diet. And you might have seen this recently with Burger King and McDonald's and things like that. Um, who are made these commitments to sustainable beef by adding lemongrass to their feed. Um, this is another false solution as well, because um, obviously it's more important to change what humans eat, right? So if we eat less cows, we don't need to worry quite as much about what they eat. And I think people will say, well, you know, we need to do something, at least it's something. But um, if you include, let's see, I have this here. If you include, um, if you look at the lemongrass diet, it reduces lifetime methane emissions by about 3%. And if you include transportation and all that, it's even more. So this is a very, very small amount of, of um, solution to a massive problem that's a huge crisis right now. So this is a false solution. Next slide, please. So in the changing marketplace, the plant-based meat category is worth nearly a billion dollars. And the, um, the foods that specifically re replace animal products have grown 30% in the past two years toward $5 billion. So this is a booming industry. It's growing, it's replacing meat, but there, it comes with controversy. Next slide, please. So some of the key challenges to the plant-based meat market are allergies to soy and wheat, perceptions that it's not gonna taste as good, um, and Jeanette, you know, objections that's not healthy, objections that they're using GM soy. The response to some of this is if there's plant-based burgers, right? It's a kind of a false um, challenge, a false um, solution, a problem to say, you know, this is not healthy, but you have to think about what it's replacing. Beef is not healthy either. So there's that. Um, that's kind of a false challenge. And then in terms of soy, well, you know, our perspective would be this is what's available right now. I think some of these producers would like to have organic soy that's not available. They're working towards that. We can push them towards that as well. But reducing the amount of beef on the marketplace is substantial. And here's the kind of difference that I can make. So two of the companies, Beyond and Impossible Burgers, for example, produce 89 to 90% fewer greenhouse gas emissions. That's significantly different than lemongrass, 3%, right? Um, they would reduce land by 93 to 96%. They reduce water use by 87 to 99% and generate no manure pollution, right? So zero manure is obviously ideal. Um, and, it, and it doesn't require slaughter. There's no cruelty. There's no cruelty to humans who are put through this. It doesn't pollute the, the rivers, um, you know, and so on and so forth. So plant-based alternatives are, are a strong one in addition to just sort of cutting out meat. Next slide, please. Um, we can go to the next slide. So talk, thinking about grass-fed beef, which is popular in the part of the world where I live and where the seam is, um, grass-fed is trending. It's something that you're going to see in every food magazine everywhere. Um, it's, it's different in our part of the world than it is um, and maybe in the rest of the country, but it, it's very popular here. It's also very expensive, and so there's uh, class things that come in as well. Um, and it's not subsidized quite the same way. But so market you know, trends are, are driving this. So you get your grass-fed burger, you feel like you're having sustainable meat, you know, you're supporting the local agriculture and so on, check and you're done. But that's not the case for me. Here's some of my concerns with it. 
Certainly grass-fed beef is more humane than factory farms. No question, no argument there, right? Um, but it still has significant issues. So to switch to an all grass-fed system, we don't have the land. The US could only produce 27% of the current um, demand for beef right now, right? So that's from Matthew Hayek, if you wanna look into that study. So I think it's something like we need another Texas if we wanted to switch to um, this land. So this itself indicates that even to have that system, we would have to substantially reduce our, our beef production and the demand. Um, it also lacks clear definitions. What is grass-fed beef? Is it cows, you know, sort of laying in the sun, chewing on grass, and that's the end of their life? It's a little more complicated than that. Many grass-fed cows eat other supplemental uh, um, items of food. It also lacks standards or certification. So who's the body who's certifying exactly what grass-fed beef is? And do people understand that grass-fed doesn't mean grass-finished? They might still end up in the feedlot right? The cows live a very short time in this system. So the impact that it's making is going to be very different. Um, it's also more expensive, as I, as I noted. Um, it doesn't come with the necessarily the regenerative goals. So even if we have a criticism for regenerative beef grazing, at least they're having these lofty goals of sinking carbon and living and coexisting, that kind of thing. Grass-fed beef doesn't necessarily have that. And number one to me, even though I put it at the bottom here, is that grass-fed beef doesn't necessarily um, in impact, uh, address the impact of grazing, right? So we're just sort of saying, okay, factory farms are gone, so now we're gonna have all these cattle on the land. That has an impact on wildlife, on biodiversity, on our ecosystems. Next slide, please. So here's a picture I actually took myself at Point Reyes. Um, you can see one side of the fence on the right there is grazed, um, and the left is not grazed. So. The claims that grazing is good for the planet are problematic, but there are some who are trying to do it better. They may be having silvopasture or agroforestry or agroecology or regenerative principles, this lofty goals of grazing in a way that's kind of lighter on the environment and works in harmony with it, hopefully non-lethal predator management as well. Some of the problems with it though, is that current demand means it's not scalable. You might have a niche farm somewhere. Um, it's gonna be obviously better in the Northeast and it's gonna be in the arid West, but it's not scalable. This is not, this is not the solution to address the systemic problem of too much beef being consumed by a lot um, and the crisis of biodiversity loss. Some of these cows are gonna end up in feedlots too. It still doesn't address the problem of slaughter. It doesn't address the problem of native species necessarily because there are varieties of these types of regenerative principles. Some of them do, some of them don't. Um, it still can have an impact on biodiversity because you can say, well, we have this pasture and it's been restored and it's beautiful and it's you know bountiful and um, you know abundance is a word that you hear a lot in this movement. Um, but what it takes to be biodiverse is not really defined, right? So a pasture that's just grass is not full of pollinators and biodiversity. It's not an ecosystem, right? So the regenerative, veganic, organic um, agriculture is so successful. And it's in a lot of ways, regenerative grazing is vague and it's reclaimed or it's claimed the narrative of regenerative agriculture. And I think we need to reclaim regenerative agriculture for what it is away from regenerative grazing, which is a little bit of greenwashing and a lot of vagary. Next slide, please. So here's our definition. Um, I put this together for what we want if we're going to have quote unquote better practices, right? So this is going to be hard to meet, but this is what we feel um, sustainable agriculture would really look like for grazing. It would protect wildlife, native wild animals would thrive, use only non-lethal wildlife management. The water must be pure, clean and drinkable, not just exist, but it actually must be pure. Um, no government subsidies. Taxpayers should not have to pay to make this industry profitable. If it's not profitable, if we have to bail it out, then we need a different industry. And I'm going to get into that in a second. Um, organic farming, livestock owners should produce and promote beef that's free of pesticides, um, chemical free feed, and so on. And antibiotic use should not be used prophylactically. And instead, we should provide sanitary conditions. Not that hard, right? Not that big of an ask. But so that's our basic start for five better practices for livestock production. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that 
we shouldn't be subsidizing the biggest polluting industries on the planet. We should be subsidizing the sustainable food that actually is sustainable. And so that's going to involve shifting policies and shifting subsidies. So currently, right now, for example, the, as I said, the industry is supporting feed crops and monocrops um, that are just terrible and taking over the entire heartlands, the middle of our country, um, as well as the beef and dairy industry are the ones who get the majority of these bailouts. They're also the ones who get the majority of the subsidies. So the, in the US, the National Dietary Guidelines recommends, for example, that adults get two to three, 2.3 cups of fruits and vegetables every day. The United States produces at best 1.7 cups per day. So we don't produce enough fruits and vegetables to feed our population. We should, we could, we can, we should subsidize it, right? So moving, moving the money that we support to sustainable, environmentally responsible um, industries is going to help these farmers. It's going to help community-based agriculture. It's going to help regenerative principles. It's going to help meet our demand on scale, right? Next slide, please. So the final solution is going to be eat less meat. Right? So here comes the part where, depending on the diet of the audience, um, it might mean a big change or might mean, or maybe your own diet is, is already more changed than this. But I think that because things are speeding up so drastically with biodiversity loss and climate change, we're calling for cutting 50% of the meat and dairy from your diet. You can save, as you can see listed there, 500,000 gallons of water, 6,000 square feet, and the greenhouse gas equivalent of driving 4,000 miles less. Um, just from cutting half of the meat and dairy out of your diet. Next slide, please. So how do you start this? Okay, so first, as I mentioned, swap beef for plant-based foods, not for chicken or fish. That's a, that's a key start right there. But eat 90% less beef. That's the message that we need to receive and we need to share with other people and needs to be in policies. So this is coming from a study from Marco Springman. It says to meet our climate mitigation goals and our other environmental goals, the um, Americans, for example, um, need to eat 90% less beef, up to 90% less beef. And that you know, kind of goes with the numbers that I've showed as well in terms of how much land is available. In terms of factory farms, the majority of the beef produced, if we end factory farms or put a moratorium on them growing and move away from that system and then reduce our consumption, 90% is doable. And this mean, instead of the three burgers that the average American eats, maybe it's three burgers a week, maybe it's one burger, a month, um, three burgers a month, excuse me, or one burger a month, or you know, treat it as a luxury, maybe it's none at all. Um, demand a just food system that's dignified, humane, coexistent, local, and organic. Those are our goals, 50% more plant-based, 50% less meat and dairy. Next slide, please. Another important thing to remember is don't waste beef and dairy particularly, don't waste food at all. Americans waste 40% um, of the food that we produce, and the food that comes with the higher environmental footprint, beef and dairy in particular, is going to be more impactful when we waste it as well. So that's a tip as, as well. And, th and that also means calling for grocery stores and restaurants to not waste beef. And that's going to mean smaller portion size as well. So these are the kinds of things that we can work towards. Um, next slide, please. Just about done here. Which leads us to the just kind of end up, well, what can I do? Does it matter? We need systemic change. What does individual change do? How should I call for a systemic change? Just the idea that individuals can influence their community, their family and friends, their neighborhoods, their PTAs, you know, get better school menus for children that are more plant-based, um, that move away from the grazing and the, the grass-fed and the beef and all this into just actual plant-based menus, help shift the market, help move collective action towards environmental protection. And then at the last slide, um, I kind of um, presented my contact information on this next slide. Um, if you'd like to contact me, you can contact me at earthfriendlydiet at biologicaldiversity.org. Uh, our websites are take sanction off your plate.com and biologicaldiversity.org. And you can ask me questions, you can share articles. I'm happy to discuss with you anything that you like about these topics. So thank you. Thank you so much. Wait, are people hearing me? Okay. Thank you so much. That was very, very informative. Um, I'm really happy that Jennifer uh, mentioned kind of the, the cultural aspects of uh, the trends in the Bay Area around grass-fed beef. I know that there are a lot of places where it's similar, but 
Perhaps not quite as much as here. Um, and I also know that a lot of the people um, that are on the Zoom call and on Facebook are not from the Bay Area or not even necessarily from the US. Um, so, you know, so I want to actually add like my two cents there, which is that, yeah, I agree completely that that's um, a big part of the culture here. I. I go sometimes to environmental conferences where I talk about veganic farming um, and, you know, and I, I criticize a bit the, the grazing thing, not from as much the environmental perspective like Jennifer, but more from the cultural perspective. Like I think about, you know, why are we talking about these things? And I was told once by um, an organizer of the conference that I was going to, um, he said that he was very happy that I was bringing up these topics because he was uncomfortable with all of the pro-grazing rhetoric at his own conference, but he just didn't feel comfortable challenging it himself. And so he was happy to have other people challenge it. Like that's how entrenched this discourse is. And, um, and it's very much part of the local foodie culture. Um, you know, San Francisco has, has uh, really a kind of like hipster coffee culture. There are a lot of like expensive coffee shops with like really good coffee. And I, and I enjoy going um, and getting myself fancy coffee sometimes. And at some point a few years ago, I started to notice that um, all of the coffee shop, you know, the coffee shops uh, that I liked um, started telling me that they didn't offer soy milk. You know, first it was just one company. I thought, okay, whatever. And then it was another one and, and they didn't offer soy milk. Um, and, and when you ask them, it's, you know, for the environment, which I'm not particularly attached to soy milk. It's not that, you know, that I'm part of the soybean industry, but what's interesting is that these same coffee shops do offer um, local organic dairy milk that comes from exactly the same area where the tule elk are being killed. Um, and one time I was at Blue Bottle, which I don't know if anyone is familiar with, it's a local coffee shop that is very successful and it was bought out by Nestle uh, two or three years ago. So Nestle really does not have a reputation for being the most, you know, sustainable, ethical company. Um, and this is a coffee shop that is owned now by Nestle. And the person told me we don't offer soy milk. Um, we can either, either give you, uh, you know, just dairy milk or I think they had um, oat milk. And I was just curious and I said, well, why don't you offer soy milk? Um, and he said, you know, for the environment. And I'm thinking, come on, you know, and even Nestle now has hopped on board of this narrative that's just become a given truth in San Francisco. Um, and a couple years ago, the director of Strauss, which is a local dairy company that sources a lot of its milk or all of its milk, I guess, from um, the organic dairy farms that are just north of here, um, wrote an article in one of our newspapers about how this idea that the dairy farming is harming the tule elk is a false problem and how dairy farming can really be part of the solution. Um, to how this region is addressing climate change. Um, so yeah, so, so I just kind of wanted to highlight that because I think that it's very interesting to see that that has become so accepted to the point where, um, you know, put, people are putting it forth as, as the, you know, we're the, the farmers the, that are stewarding the land, we're saving it, et cetera, when in the exact same region, we actually have other people doing other things, but they don't get the same visibility, they don't get the same subsidies. Um, and so that's why I think it's really cool that we have um, Sydney here, who's from more or less the same region and who has a different model of growing food and one that, you know, you know, it seems it does not have the same impacts on wildlife, uses less land, doesn't harm the water in the same way, and so on. So, um, all right, so I'll just read you Sydney's bio and then we'll get started. So Sydney Grange is the Assistant Garden Manager at Victory Gardens for Peace, a biointensive research, education, and demonstration site located in Mendocino, California. Victory Gardens for Peace is a project of Ecology Action, an organization that's dedicated to teaching, practicing, and researching biointensive agriculture, a method that's focused on growing complete diets in minimal space while building soil and conserving resources. She serves on the board for Garden Friendly Community Fort Bragg, 
a local initiative working to ensure and sustain food sec security in Fort Bragg, California by supporting home and community gardening. Garden-friendly community Fort Bragg is on its way to breaking ground in the first community garden for Fort Bragg this year. Prior to joining Ecology Action, Sydney worked on a 10-acre vegetable farm near New Haven, Connecticut. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much, Nassim, for having me and for hosting this awesome, awesome series. I feel like I've already learned so much. And yeah, thanks, Jennifer and Chema, for the background. Um, super insightful. And Jennifer, I feel like a lot of the solutions you mentioned, Biointensive plugs nicely into those. So um, yeah, I'll delve into Biointensive. And Chema, I believe you have my, if you don't mind presenting my slides, thanks. Um, yeah, so I guess we could go to the next slide. <laughs> um, Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, so Grow Bio Intensive, Nassim, you touched on, touched on it briefly. Um, I'm sure some of you are already familiar. Um, it's a simple and low tech agricultural method that's been developed um, from a variety of traditional agricultural methods from around the world. Um, and then and then also built upon the biodynamic French intensive gardening, which Alan Chadwick brought to UC Santa Cruz in 1966. Um, and John Jevons learned from Alan Chadwick and then brought a lot of the French, um, the biodynamic French intensive method to um, his work, although like took it and looked at how we could adapt it to our current situation of our growing population, sustainability problems, um, needing to address um, food security. And so Ecology Action over the past 48 years has been re researching and developing Grow Bio Intensive. Um, you can see in the upper right hand corner, that's the, the headquarters, the Ecology Action headquarters and the site it, in Willits, um, which is near, nearby an hour and a half inland from, from our site here on the coast. Um, and they started that garden on a soil that a, a very terrible, very poor soil on a very sloped hillside and in a really difficult climate where you can have 40 degree temperature changes within the same, the same day. Um, and yet they've been able to have a super productive garden there where they've been running um, in, internships um, for, uh, for almost their entire time they've been around. Um, and then we have the Victory Gardens for Peace initiative. Um, and which is, you can see in the below image, that's one photo of our garden. You'll see a lot more throughout this presentation. Um, we're a project of Ecology Action and similarly are also a biointensive research um, education and demonstration site. Um, and we also kind of have the approach of trying to foster a, a gardening culture and to foster an overall culture and um, for peace and for sustainability and kind of inspired by the the Victory Gardens movement during the World Wars, and particularly, I've I've felt inspired by, and I think in the VGFP initiative was kind of inspired by the statistic that over forty percent of um, the fresh fruits and vegetables grown in the United States in the Second World War were grown in in Victory Gardens in people's backyards, in lawns, in public spaces, and so to me that's really encouraging, and it shows me that you know there's a lot we can do to be our own food producers, um, to contribute less to this, you know, overarching food system that is, as we've heard a lot about, you know, not something necessarily that we want to align with. Um, and then the Grow Intensive Method is very um, internationally focused. It's practiced in 152 different, different countries um, in virtually all soils and climates where food can be grown. Um, it's particularly, big in Latin America um, and Kenya. So, okay, next slide, please. Um, one thing I love about Grow Bio Intensive is the focus on the soil. This is obviously something that's been missing from conventional agriculture since I'm sure you all are aware of some of these statistics, but the fact that we, that half of our, the world's topsoil has been lost over the last 150 years and it's estimated the UN in 2015 made a statement estimating that we only have 60 years left of farmable soil if we continue our practices you know in including excessive tillage and not proper cover cropping and um, not proper covering 
you know, all the like just not proper agricultural practices. Um, and of course, like the topsoil is essential for a healthy, um, for, for food production um, because of, you know, the nutrient cycling and the life that occurs mostly within the top um, six inches of soil. And in nature, it actually takes, there's different estimates ranging from 500, depend, 500 years to 2000 years, depending on your climate and other factors. But it takes about a thousand years to build up just one inch of topsoil. And so, you know, I think that it makes me particularly concerned about, about the soil. And I think that we need to have a particular emphasis on it. Um, and even organic agriculture, although it's like a step in the right direction, a lot of the times the soil, although it's taken care of on site, it's relying on inputs, biomass, um, compost, and other, you know, means of soil fertility from other people's soils. So it's, you know, my, taking mining from one soil, taking nutrients from one soil to feed your soil, which, you know, is not sustainable indefinitely. Um, and it's probably inequitable in its consequences. Um, and so, um, oh, next slide. <laughs> yeah, so the Grow Bio Intensive Approach to Sustainability, we focus on growing soil, not plants. Of course, we grow plants too, but the soil always comes first and that also determines how we grow plants. Um, and we strive for a closed loop system. Um, and essential to our soil fertility within that is growing compost crops, which are crops that produce, um, oh, sorry, growing carbon crops, which um, crops we consider carbon crops, which are, you know, crops that produce a lot of biomass um, that we build our compost out of, um, or that are big contributors to our compost piles, and then, you know, in turn provide our soil with lots of organic matter. Um, a missing element of our closed loop, our, the system we're striving for um, and from a lot of agricultural systems is human manure. Human waste is like an incredible resource that definitely needs to be captured and utilized within our agricultural systems in order for anything to be closed loop or um, indefinitely sustainable. Um, so until that's, you know, made possible to be used legally, properly and safely, which there are means of doing that. I think there are just like a lot of regulations in place that make it, it challenging. And then of course, you know, there are safety concerns with it. So um, might take some more um, research, research on how to do that on a small scale. But um, yeah, so moving on to, um, so as with this closed loop system focus, we're also, ensuring that we're growing um, enough nutrient rich food for the people that are, are farming it or relying on that land. Um, and so that's another important aspect of sustainability um, to not just feed, ensure the soil is healthy, not just ensure your plants are healthy, but ensuring you're healthy as well. Um, and so we have, you know, complete diet plans that consider all micro and macronutrients and include that within our, our spaces that we design. Um, and then, of course, the one of the biggest things we focus on is minimizing space to just minimize our agricultural footprint, because it's kind of just obvious, like no matter how sustainable it is, like any, um, you know, any form of agriculture is a you know, preventing a natural ecosystem from occurring in that in that space. Um, and so we just strive to minimize it so that everybody has enough land to grow their own food and also so that we have enough land for wildlife and for um, natural ecosystems. Okay, next slide, please. So ecology action through practicing grow biointensive, and I'll get more into about what that looks like, um, has found that you can accomplish um, using 67 to 88% less water than conventional agriculture. Um, and most of these are compared to conventional agriculture, so not, just keep that in mind, but using 50 to 100% less purchased fertilizer, using 99% less energy, it is all hand powered. We don't use any fossil fuels. Um, so that's a lot of where that comes from. Um, producing two to six times the yields and then a uh, UC Berkeley master's thesis found that um, this was based off of the research they were doing at the first first um, biointensive site in Palo Alto. Um, over the course of eight years, they found that they were building soil up to 60 times faster than naturally, naturally occurs. Um, and then 
you know, of course, reducing the land area. Okay, next slide, please. So the way that we achieve this is through what we call this whole systems approach. It's seven principles, although the eighth principle is a whole systems approach using them all together. Um, so we have deep soil preparation. Um, we use tillage, but only as often as necessary um, and as much as, need, as much as needed. So we only prepare the soil once per year to a depth of 24 inches. And this allows to us to improve the soil structure and to um, allow proper nutrient cycling. And also allows us to do a intensive planting or close plant spacing, which is another um, principle of the whole systems approach. So with the intensive planting, we can fit four times um, the amount of plants in the same amount of space that you know more um, conventional agriculture can through just the row, the row cultivation. And typically, conventional agriculture will plant in rows, you know, so that they can put it, you know, bring a tractor through there. Um, and so, um, yeah. And that also has, you know, the added benefits of like having a living mulch, um, which provides a microclimate, prevents weeds, um, and of course increases the amount of plants we can grow in our yields. Um, then there's, you know, companion planting. While we do try to minimize the amount of space we have for agriculture, we do try to emulate ecosystems and provide like habitat for, for wildlife where we can in our gardens, um, ensuring that we have enough diversity, enough pollinator friendly, friendly plants, um, enough space for them. And we also are always ensuring to keep our, our, so our soil health in check by not planting plant families in two consecutive seasons in a row, by in always ensuring we have a legume um, planted at least once a year to, you know, you to ensure we're bringing in enough nitrogen into our soil. And so we are very, um, very particular with the way we do crop rotations. Um, and then of course, I've already mentioned the carbon farming. Um, the carbon farming is um, the key element of how we make this a closed loop system and how um, we bring in a lot of our soil fertility. We grow these 60% crops that, build, that, bring, that sequester a lot of carbon, produce a lot of biomass, also produce really nutrient dense um, sources of calories in their seeds. So a lot, examples of these crops would be like grains, corn, sunflowers, quinoa. Quinoa and grains here and sunflowers are some of the main ones that we use. Quinoa particularly is um, a favorite of mine to grow here. Um, because of you know how nutrient rich it is and calorically dense it is for a small amount of amount of weight while also producing biomass um, and then calorie farming that's incorporating crops that are very space efficient in terms of their calorie production um, and those are things like potatoes and leeks and garlic things of that nature um, Oh, I, I'm sure, I mean, I already mentioned composting. Of course, that's essential. And that's where all of our, most of our fertility comes from. We do, we use cold, we do um, use cold composting um, techniques in order to ensure that we're maximizing the amount of organic matter um, that we get from our biomass. And open pollinated seeds, is another element of what we do at Victory Gardens for Peace. We actually have a seed bank that is open to the open to the public, where we give out seeds to free for the community. And saving seeds is a part of is a part of the method. So a lot of these seeds are grown on site and adapted locally to our climate here. And then other people can contribute seeds that they have also grown um, locally locally as well. And so that's another key element to this whole systems approach and to a resilient food system, you know, having like locally adapted seeds and ensuring we're maintaining a diverse, um, a diverse collection of these, of these seeds. And then the added benefit is that you don't have to rely on, you know, seed companies every year purchasing seeds from seed companies. Okay, next slide, please. Hmm. Um, let me see what that one. Oh, okay, there it is. Um, yeah, this is just kind of 
you know, more specifically how ecology action over time through their research has found um, how to effectively grow a complete, a complete diet while also taking care of your soil in the small amount of smallest amount of space. Um, the metric they found is that if you put 60% of your area in carbon and calorie crops, those are the, you know, the carbon crops I was mentioning before, the, the quinoa, the grains, the sunflowers, etc. Um, 30% in the high calorie root crops, those are the calorie crops I was mentioning before, your potatoes, your garlic, your leeks, your sunchokes, things that are really area efficient um, that help you to reduce your space. And then 10% in what we consider vegetable crops, you know, vegetables for vegetables and fruits for vitamins and minerals, um, which are important for the diet element. Next slide, please. So yeah, and while Ecology Action has done, is, has done a lot of work over the years figuring out how to develop um, you know, growing food in the smallest amount of space possible. We're always continuing this research and here at Victory Gardens for Peace, um, myself and Matt Druno, the manager of Victory Gardens for Peace, um, we're both doing, doing these land use studies. Both of us are, are doing separate diet designs and both like take place within about just a thousand square feet. And both of us have found that we were able to grow um, a complete diet with meeting your compost needs in that amount of space. Um, my study is newer and it's ongoing. So I'm like still recording data and we'll have it ongoing for a few years. And his is like further along in the process. And here he, he's like working on a booklet that um, focuses, that provides a lot more information on it. But essentially, um, yeah, what this is pretty encouraging because it shows that in just a thousand square feet, if you're able to grow all of your own food and compost materials, you know, that's only 1% of the space required to grow the average American diet. And that number the one, is based off of um, a pretty conservative estimate of what the American diet is. Um, and then one other interesting study that we're working on is typically um, over the course of the season, we'll put a legume like we'll have a nitrogen fixer planted on its own in a bed solely to focus on just fixing nitrogen within that bed. Um, and so normally that we'll put in like a fava bean, for example, over winter. Um, and then, you know, we'll just focus the main season on growing our, our food crops because we won't, we won't consume that, that fava bean because you want to harvest it before it goes to bean in order to ensure the nitrogen stays in the soil. But we are doing this study where we're looking at whether if you interplant woolly pod vetch, which is particularly good at like fix, fixing nitrogen, um, larger amounts of nitrogen in the soil um, with a grain crop, with a calorie crop over the winter, um, whether you know you can meet your, your nitrogen, your nitrogen needs in your soil. You know, we're getting half from our compost and half from our nitrogen fixers. And so we have an ongoing study right now looking at that. And you know, we won't have results for a while, but if, if it shows that we can grow calories and fix nitrogen simultaneously without having to have a nitrogen fixer in the soil on its, on its own over the winter, then we might be able to reduce the land area that we're currently growing in further. Next slide, please. So this is just so interesting to know every year we do soil testing in our garden to ensure we're, you know, to ensure we're taking the best care of our, our soil health and we get recommendations from um, a soil scientist. And this is like the Victory Gardens when it was started around 2010 um, up until 2015. It's broken into different sections based on soil type. Um, but you can see like the increase in um, percent organic matter over the years. Um, which you know we've been able to accomplish through through growing these carbon crops and through composting correctly um, or properly. Um, so, and then below El, Mes El Mesquite, which is a biointensive site in Aguas Caliente, Mexico, um, they noted similar increase percent increases over a similar time frame that we did. And then, you know, since 2015, our levels have 
remained fairly fairly steady. Um, but it was just interesting to see that they have experienced similar results through practicing biointensive that we we have. Um, and then you know these results were compared to just for reference, like a no-till. There was this peer-reviewed no-till article that looked at nine different um, no-till studies um, that found on average a 0.1% organic matter increase um, per year. And so relatively to other systems, grow intensive is pretty effective at, um, at building and maintaining organic matter. And so I just thought that was interesting. Um, next slide. Um, these are just some photos of our programs. You know, we have a bunch of different types of internships. Um, last year we had um, a woman from Puerto Rico. We had two, one person from Chile, one person from Walmapu, which is in Mapuche territory. Um, one, like one domestic intern, you know, we have people that come from all of our former programs. And at the Willett site, they had um, some, an intern from Kenya and two interns from Nicaragua. Um, and we train people to become certified biointensive teachers and then to go run their own projects. And a lot of times people will already kind of have a project, project going or on their mind, but just want a more formal training. So we'll come to us and be trained here. Um, and so this is just some photos of, you know, the internship programs and some of the stuff we do. And okay, next slide. <laughs> um, this is just some examples of carbon farming, you know, quinoa. I wish I could have included, I mean, there's already a lot of photos on here, but quinoa is just such a beautiful plant. And we have like 13 different varieties in our seed bank. Um, I recommend growing it. It's really cool to see its growth. Um, you can see it's, it's the one in the lower right. And also, I mean, I included a lot of it. It's like in the upper right, in the upper left, and in the lower right. And um, yeah, you can see a lot of our grains and our fava beans, which we let go over winter. Um, and then you can see some folks building a compost pile from those materials. Next slide, please. Yeah, we have a variety of international um, projects. If you're interested in more of the details, I recommend just looking at Ecology Action's newsletter. I can't speak to like all the details. I've only been here for, you know, a year and a half now, but there is the woman on the left runs a program in British Columbia. The folks in the middle, they're a part of Frederick, who was an intern last year, a part of his program that he's starting up in Kenya which is also a part of like a broader um, movement in Kenya um, that's been more established called GBAC, which is Grow Biointensive. They have a Grow Biointensive Ag Center. GBAC stands for Grow Biointensive Ag Center of Kenya. And they've trained over 9,000 farmers and interns from all over Africa and beyond Africa. And so Frederick's project kind of works, works within that, but then also takes it, you know, out further. And so th there's some pictures from his, his project here. Next slide. Um, yeah, Frederick is the one in the red t-shirt on the bottom. So that's him leading a three-day workshop. And there is a workshop in the upper right. And um, I think that was probably in Nicaragua, but Augustine and Marisol who run the um, biointensive farm in Mexico are in that, in that photo. Um, and then Camila, an intern last year who lives in Valparaiso, Chile, um, she like has started a lot of gardens and vacant lots um, and things of that nature, working in a more urban setting. And you can see in the in the middle on the bottom there, um, that's a picture of um, one of her gardens she started in an abandoned um, lot. And then in the upper left is, that's GBAC. Um, that's the organization I mentioned, one of the events they hosted. Cool, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I think that Grow Biointensive presents a really great opportunity to produce a lot, of, to become more of a producer um, within this like, within this unjust and unsustainable food system. Um, and, you know, if a lot of us could just take responsibility for just a little bit of our own our own diet, take a little bit of into our own hands through the joy of gardening, um, I think we could really accomplish a lot. Um, so I just recommend if you do have a garden space, um, and it doesn't have to be a lot of space, even in 100 square feet, you can produce a whole lot of food. Um, 
yeah, I recommend starting a small space. I recommend trying to grow some carbon crops and um, grains. They're actually a whole lot easier to grow and process on a small scale than you might think. Um, and so I feel like that was something that was pretty empowering to learn and see coming here. Um, and so I recommend that. And then we have a bunch of free resources on growbiointensive.org for you know how to garden. Um, and yeah, and if you don't have, you know, garden space, that's something that, you know, we need to work on. We need to work on making more garden space accessible. Um, and that's something that we're, we're working on here in Fort Bragg through the Garden Friendly Community Initiative for Fort Bragg. And um, that's another important area to work on within ensuring local food production. So yeah, I think that concludes my talk for the day. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, all right. Oh, it's already it's already pretty late, um, but it was very interesting. Um, so there are quite a few questions from people. Uh, so I actually have a lot of questions for both of you, but I guess I'm gonna not ask them all so that I can leave, you know, more time to questions from others. But I do want to ask maybe like two um, or something. Um, so the first one, I guess could be, you know, could be for either Jennifer or Sydney or both of you. Um, and you've already touched upon this, but maybe if you had more to say, um, you know, so Sydney like mentioned that as well as, you know, people might do something on the plot that they're farming, no matter how well that's done, um, at the end of the day, it's still going to be better to just leave the land be because agriculture is not the same as just a natural ecosystem. Um, and so I kind of wanted to ask your thoughts on that, because I've also heard from proponents of regenerative grazing, sometimes the opposite idea that, you know, just rewilding and just leaving the land is not necessarily ideal. Um, and that sometimes it is much better to have more of like a human kind of management that often would take the, uh, you know, would be done through um, some sort of uh, well-managed grazing as a way to restore ecosystems and build soil and so on. And so with that kind of vision, um, arguments around land use are often not something that is very convincing to people because they say, well, land use isn't necessarily something that we need to minimize when we're not actually harming the land and the ecosystems. Instead, we're helping restore them. So, you know, so I kind of wonder if, if either of you wants to say anything about that, kind of this idea of like, you know, there's sort of the, the debate or the argument about how do we use the land that we're farming? That's one thing. But then there's also just should we minimize that land regardless so that the rest can be rewilded or whatever? Um, yeah. So either one, if you want to say anything on that would be great. Um, yeah, well, I spoke a little bit. I don't want to hog this. So I'd love to hear from Sydney if she wants to speak. But um... This is a big question with a big answer, but I just will try to say that we have a bit of a confirmation bias in our belief that we should be managing all the land or that the land needs us um, over nature and um, particularly Western colonial practices where we don't listen to native indigenous practices that have been living and coexisting with the land. And that's something we need to listen to. But all we need to do is really look at the park service to look at this. This is areas where land isn't managed, it doesn't, isn't grazed, I should say, um, and it's thriving, right? And so you look at land that is grazed and has a different look. Um, so the argument that we absolutely need to have non-native bovine species, and particularly in the arid west, um, in order to manage the land doesn't hold up in that way. Um, there are, are more responsible practices than others, for sure, and we need to grow food. Um, we probably need to grow a lot less beef than we are growing right now, but do we need to manage the land in order for it to be vital um, 
in these open spaces is questionable. Of course, how we grow food can be more responsibly done. That's, a, that's what I would say there. But I think that none of these practices should take the place of rewilding. Um, rewilding alone, can it work? Yes, I think we can, that's evident all around us. Yeah, I would agree with what Jennifer said. Um, I think that you know, there's room, like even within minimizing the space we're using for more intensive agriculture production, like I'm speaking to, there's still room within the the outside ecosystems to manage that in whatever, you know, whatever way may be fit for that particular ecosystem, which maybe that involves, you know, some form of like food production as well. But I do think it's important to like understand what it looks like to minimize our space and grow as much of our calories for a small amount of space as we can because of like these these challenges we're facing and like the the needs of like our growing population, the caloric needs of our growing population, like the studies I've seen like have shown that you know no-till and also more perennial systems that are kind of more integrative they don't necessarily they don't produce calories as effectively on um, a small like per space so i do think it's important to be thinking about producing calories on a small amount of space because we have a lot of people we have to feed Yeah, I mean, I've come across this idea um, of grains is inherent, grains and legumes um, is inherently destructive and, you know, that necessarily leads to soil degradation. Um, and that a lot of the problems of our world really environmentally, socially stem from basically civilization and when we planting wheat and these grains. So it's really interesting to see that your sustain um, you're growing that because I think that a lot of people aren't the works here. They're the opposite narrative where grains are totally um, opposite the idea of regulating ecosystems. Um, I wanted to ask you one more thing, like maybe you want to comment on what I just said, but I also want to add in another question, Sydney. Um, so you guys train people around the world. Is biointensive doable everywhere? And also, um, I know that I think that when John Jevons first developed biointensive initially, he did use sheep or other animals. And then with this idea of um, maximizing uh, um, like land productivity or you know, minimizing land use, um, he eventually went to a system that was by default without farmed animals. So, but I know that there are some biointensive growers who do have animals. So what does it look like when you include animals in the system? Does that necessarily entail like more, more land use or you know, are there places where that's necessary? I don't necessarily, this is speaking from kind of my like limited, Understanding, I think I have a lot of um, understanding of even like our international programs and like our work internationally before I could, you know, speak more comprehensively to this. But, um, um, oh my gosh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, okay, let me think about this for a second because I totally just blanked out on what I was going to say. Yeah, I also did like a multi-part question there, so that might have been a bit confusing. Yeah, <laughs> the first chunk is that um, grow biointensive. So I guess it's important to distinguish. I didn't actually include like the trademark like in my presentation, but John Jevons or like Ecology Action um, utilize grow biointensive all capitals with like a trademark when it's referring to like our specific like um, sticking really strictly to the eight principles and like meeting Ecology Action's comprehensive definition of sustainability. Um, and there are biointensive, there are a lot of places that farm biointensively that aren't necessarily, you know, meeting that comprehensive definition of sustainability. And the reason for that trademark is just so that if you're hosting like a workshop or a class, like if you don't see that, you know that maybe it 
might not be meeting the standards of like a closed loop biointensive system that Ecology Action has set out. Um, and I feel like a lot of places do have challenges other countries do have challenges with totally taking animals out of the system, but it's more so just uh, um, it, in like Kenya in particular, like I know culturally, um, like they're very reliant and have been for a long time on, on manures. And so I think it's more, it's like just as much the cultural aspect as it is just like gravitating away from that as like a farming practice um, in terms of in terms of the challenges of moving away from manures. But like, um, but grown biointensive, um, but grow biointensive allows the leeway for farms that are using manures to slowly take those, you know, inputs out of their systems over time. Um, and so, like you can still become a grow bio intensive certified farm as long as you're meeting, meeting certain requirements over a, a given amount of time. And yeah, going back to, I think one of your initial questions, um, ecology action, um, initially when they were looking at growing diets, they first were looking at how to um, provide income for farmers for like the first seven years, like how to most effectively provide income for farmers and then the next seven years or so, we're focused on um, how can we, you know, feed people in the smallest amount of space. And at that point, they were still using manures. Um, and then they started focusing on how to, you know, improve soil. And then by at that point, they found like based on on their research, just how intensive it was to try to um, provide for your soil and for your, you know animals to maintain manures within your system. And so gradually, because of this, the research that they were doing, they just found that it wasn't an efficient use of space to incorporate animal manures. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, so this question, I think you might have already uh, answered uh, somewhat, I'll read it. Um, Hi, Sydney, I'm reading your bio. Uh, you are focused on growing complete diets in minimal space while building soil and conserving resources. How big or small should minimal space be um, for the average person in, men in average per person in Mendocino to, to achieve a complete diet year round? Um, given that by complete, you are meaning fully plant-based, nutritional, tasty, self-reliant, diverse, and vegan organic. Um, looking to get links to websites where I can get more information. And then a follow-up question is, uh, what would the cost of like a thousand square feet in Mendocino, California be? So I guess like how feasible would it be for someone to, to set out with that intention of growing their own food? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, so Ecology Action through the research they've done, they've like narrowed it down to like the sustainable amount of land um, available per person, like if we wanna accommodate for everyone globally while not depleting soil is about 4,000 square feet. And that accounts for leaving half of the space in wild. So if you're going by, you know, ecology actions metric, um, you probably should shoot for having 40 beds or like four, um, 40, 1,000, um, you should shoot for having 4,000 or less square feet that you're um, growing food within. Um, although like it's definitely feasible to, to minimize that and I recommend just starting small and experimenting and not necessarily tasking yourself at the beginning with trying to grow your entire diet um, because I think that that's something that you know can be overwhelming to delve into at first. Um, but like with Matt and I's research, like we are finding that it is possible to do within a thousand square feet. Um, so I think that you can grow a significant portion of your diet within, within that. I don't necessarily know what land costs. I haven't really looked into that here. I'm, I'm assuming it's pretty expensive for even just a thousand square feet in Mendocino, but, it, um, yeah, I feel like that brings up the importance of just having more public spaces available to gardens. And so that's what we're working with with the Garden Friendly Community Initiative for 
with Fort Bragg um, is just starting more, more gardens so that more people have access to these spaces to grow their food. Um, and we don't necessarily need everybody to grow all their own food. I think just if everybody has, you know, the is able to grow some of their own food, um, you know, if they if they want to, I feel like that should be should be a right. And so I think like through the combination of utilizing the land at your residence, if, it, if you do have any and community spaces, um, I think there could be there's a lot of potential there. Um, yeah, I said question is for me. Um, the argument that grazing is beneficial is basically um, mostly based in, in trying to replace the ecological benefits from native ungulates like bison. Um, but cows are not bison and they're not deer and they're not elk. And so it's not necessarily um, a no brainer replacement. They behave differently. They trample differently. They um, disperse differently further from water than cattle do. Cattle stay closer to the water. They trample the riverbeds differently. They sediment the streams differently. So it's not necessarily just a matter of, well, we eradicated bison and so now we've got to put um, cows on the land, uh, it's not it's not providing the same benefits that that much is, is certain. There are ecological benefits that we can talk about, but it isn't the question of replacing them. And I think what what I'm trying to say is that we need to restore biodiversity. We need to focus on increasing biodiversity in these areas, um, whether you call it rewilding or not. Restoring ecosystems, not just lands, right? So we can't just think about it as just land, just soil, but these are complex ecosystems that require biodiversity. And so by restoring that, um, it's going to have the ecological impact that is far broader and more complex and richer than simply putting cows on the land and hoping that works. And um, if I may add to that, I, I think. Um, Part of this uh, narrative and, and proposal, right, of, of using cows as surrogates is also ultimately a, a um, political proposal, right? Uh, th there's, it, it's very easy to, to propose uh, something that aligns well with uh, powerful political interests uh, instead of saying, well, you know, uh, we actually could uh, bring back these uh, native wild uh, life uh, to these places. Uh, it, it's just not... Uh, uh, financially lucrative uh, for the people who, who now control access to these spaces, right? Um, and I, I think many folks, particularly uh, those that, that are uh, attracted to regenerative grazing, uh, don't, don't necessarily realize that or maybe identify culturally with those powerful interests, right? But it, it is a, a, a very political uh, uh, solution, right? Uh, that, that uh, or not solution, a very political problem that's being proposed. Uh, so we have a couple of more questions here. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone who's still on the line. I see that we've got about 20 uh, attendees. Um, and some of these questions are, are, are very general. Uh, this question of um, are plant-based burger, plant burgers sustainable? And I guess the same goes for, for a lot of these general uh, uh, plant-based alternatives. I don't know if either Sydney or Jennifer you'd like to tackle it. Uh, well, again, I, I'd love to hit, hear from Sydney because I've done a lot of talking, but um, are they sustainable? That's a broad question. Are they better for the planet than beef? No question. There's some problems that need to be addressed. They need to move away from um, use of, of soy and so forth that is GM modified. If, if you, you can make that argument, um, you can also make a different argument, but are they more sustainable than cows? Definitely. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add to that aside from the fact that I agree that it's better than the alternative of meat um, and can provide important immediate um, benefits to ecosystems and to animals. Um, however, I don't think it's a long-term sustainable option. I don't think it changes any um, sort of distribution of you know wealth necessarily within our food system. I think that, you know, we have to start advocating for like lo local um, economies and, you know, become more of our own local producers in order to ensure we're sustaining soil fertility and things of that nature. 
Thank you. Uh, that, that's a wonderful answer and uh, somewhat related. Uh, we do have a more technical question directed at you, Sydney. Uh, does biointensive still promote a double digging or um, are they now advocating no-till? Yeah, um, double digging is one of the main, com is one of the methods, um, one of the principles of biointensive. And that is how one of the ways in which we're able to reduce our land area. Um, you know, we're able to provide this adequate soil structure for our plants, which allows us to fit more plants within a given area. But it also allows us to get more biomass per unit of area and return more organic matter than we, you know, potentially might deplete through cultivation. Um, and so as you might have seen in my presentation earlier, um, through biointensive practices, which include double digging, um, we've been able to steadily increase our organic matter and um, maintain it where it is um, at, while also improving yields, um, which is something that no-till, um, I have not, seen the studies that I've seen on no-till, um, you know, it takes more land to grow food no-till than with, um, with tillage. So um, that's also how we're able to reduce our area. And this is a question uh, which I, I don't know if uh, either of you will have the answer to, uh, but uh, it, we have a question around this question of New Zealand uh, research uh, that has hit the media recently. Uh, it talks about uh, beef and sheep farms um, uh, approaching being carbon neutral, right? Uh, and it, looking to the research, it appears that some of the woody areas and trees on the farms are uh, sequestering carbon to, to offset their emissions. Um, and uh, the, the uh, person who has a question is reasoning that uh, this is <coughs> because uh, they have very large areas and low stock rates. Um, do you see anything else that could be influencing these results? Um, my comment tonight would just be as an interesting area and just with silvo pasture and agroforestry in the United States as well is that they're looking to find ways to graze cattle that don't chop down trees and that, you know, live in harmony with the, the planet and they, they balance the carbon sink um, with the trees um, and so forth with, you know, the emissions that come from cattle. Um, that's an interesting area and I absolutely think that it, low stocking rates is requirement for that. For sure, and that's prob that's one of the problems with scalability, right? Is that these huge demand uh, requires higher stocking rates, which just makes regenerative principles harder to do. I would just point out there with the, I just I have some skepticism about the the carbon neutral part of that, but then also just to add to that conversation, just just from what I'm trying to show is that carbon isn't the only problem here, and and you know coexisting with the wildlife um, and the impacts on the water and so forth, and the methane and carbon's not the only game here, but yeah, I think that's part of the what's going on there. Yeah, that, that's important. Anything to add, Sydney? I, I don't have much to add. Thank you for covering that. <clears throat> uh, well, I, 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 I think it is important to emphasize uh, what Jennifer did mention, this question of looking at it holistically. And it's very easy to, to get caught up in, in specific metrics like uh, carbon offsetting or, or carbon neutral, right? Uh, but there are a lot of other emissions uh, uh, and, and a lot of other impacts, right? Uh, and ecosystems that that uh, the, these, uh, well, what I, I would call false solutions don't really address. And again, uh, the, the, the who, who's benefiting ultimately, uh, whose uh, wallets are being lined, I, I think for me is always something that I, I look to at first. Right, um, so I, I think that's that's important to look at. And, and New Zealand, uh, much like the United States, has been a country that has um, been um, changed uh, uh, almost from the ground up uh, because of animal agriculture in in a very recent, in a very quick uh, uh, couple of hundred years. Right, uh, so it's 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 important to highlight that. Um, and I see here, do do we have more questions? This is an interesting question. Uh, so how do you grow food all year round when most parts of the world 
uh, have uh, short growing seasons. Uh, commercial arable uh, agriculture, I I'm guessing, is harmful to the biosphere and our health or highly unpredictable with significant losses if no chemicals are used. Uh, that's that's interesting. Uh, Sydney, I'll let you uh, take the first stab at that since I, I think that seems to be uh, uh, part of the uh, things that, that Biointensive seems to be addressing. Yeah, we have sites that grow successfully with just like a four month, you know, four month growing season. Um, and so I think it just involves a little bit more um, in intensive planning. Um, but then a lot of our sites are in like more tropical regions where they actually have more of like a year round growing season, which provides them the potential to even reduce the amount of space they need for their, their diets even further. Um, so I feel like it is kind of like a mixed bag. Like there's definitely areas in the world where it's more difficult, but I do think it's navigatable, navigable um, with just the right, the right planning. And we have some sites in Russia and, and British Columbia that have shorter growing seasons and they're able to successfully, you know, meet their, their needs. Um, and here we have a really cool, we have a longer growing season, but it's very cool. So we struggle to grow a lot of warmer loving crops. Um, so, you know, each climate presents its own challenges, um, but I think that, you know, you can work around it. It just kind of takes getting to know the region and speaking to other farmers there and figuring out what, what grows best and growing the right types of crops for that area. Uh, Jennifer, anything you'd like to add to that? No. Um, I, what I do want to add is um, uh, at the beginning when I first talked about uh, uh, historical context, right? One thing that I uh, glossed over, uh, but I think is important to mention is of course the state of agriculture um, in, in, in 1491, right? And uh, I, I think that that to me is one of the crucial things that uh, people are terribly uneducated by uh, here in North America. We have uh, a, a uh, all research seems to indicate that some of the uh, most densely populated parts of the world were here in North America, right? Uh, and, and there were ultimately very, very uh, societies that were uh, effectively plant-based, right? Animal uh, agriculture was non-existent and any animal consumption was, uh, was uh, minimal at best, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, I, 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 I think it's important, right, that people educate themselves around uh, what the situation was in North America, what the situation was in many other places, but ultimately the parallels that exist between uh, these uh, very dense and urban societies uh, as they existed in, in 1491 and how they exist uh, today, right? So, so definitely, I, I think a lot of parallels. And I, I think we're getting close to the point where we ought to be wrapping up. But yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, I, I think we're going to have to wrap it up uh, soon. There's still a couple of questions, but uh, folks, anybody, if we didn't get to any of the questions, please uh, feel free to uh, send them over email. Uh, we, we have plenty of opportunities. I did want, again, to thank Jennifer and Sydney for uh, coming and participating in this. I, I, I definitely learned a lot and I, I see that we still have uh, close to 20 people here, plus another uh, 10 or so people or more actually on Facebook. So we got great uh, participation. Uh, we will upload a recording of this later uh, so that people who were not able to see it uh, can participate. I, I wanna give you to uh, a, a last opportunity to chime in or say anything else that you'd like to say. Thank you. I just uh, really enjoyed being here and enjoyed everybody's questions. And I can see that there's a lot more questions, um, particularly from I think the regenerative crowd who are very passionate um, I would just, I would just urge that when people say um, one of our strong messages needs to be reduction, not promotion of, of other meat with plant-based diets, but reduction, that we are on the same page. We both want to protect the environment. We want decolonized, just, humane, ethical, fair diets, right? And so this is not a either or situation, but we need to um, make the message of reduction primary in order to 
move towards that ideal diet. And I'm happy to answer anybody else's questions on Facebook or if you want to email me or so forth, but uh, just know that I'm, I'm participating in that conversation with you. Um, we might not agree on everything, but just really focus on considering other environmental impacts as well. So that's my point. Thank you for having me. And, and I really enjoyed uh, everything you shared, Cindy. Thanks. Yeah, I really enjoyed everything you shared as well and everything you shared, Chema and Nassim, for what you shared and for facilitating this panel. Um, yeah, and I look forward to continuing the dialogue. Also, feel free to email me. I did write my email at some point in the chat, but it's just sydney.grange at gmail.com. Um, yeah, I would love to talk with folks further, um, exchange resources, etc. So yeah, hope to hear from some of you. Thank you. Uh, and again, please remember to check out the uh, Center for Biological Diversity and Ecology Action. Um, it, it's very important in, for anybody uh, here. If you want to continue supporting this webinar series, uh, please uh, consider donating to uh, seedtocommons.causevox.com. Uh, the link is, uh, is on the uh, chat. Uh, it helps making make sure that we continue these uh, series. And our next one is scheduled for two weeks from now, definitely follow us on Facebook so you can continue seeing these. And uh, again, uh, thank you so much to uh, Jennifer and Sydney for coming. Thank you for everybody who stuck around. Uh, very interesting uh, conversation and definitely challenging, right? I, I think it's important to be challenging uh, the status quo around these issues. Um, thank you again.